You've just listened to the beginning of the opening chorus of Bach's cantata BWV3, Ach Gott, wie manches Herzeleid. God, how oft a heartfelt grief confronted me within these days. The narrow path is sorrow filled, which I to heaven travel must. So what was Bach trying to express in 1725 when he wrote his piece? Is it a kind of crisis of human existence? Is it the ache of our heart that we have to endure while waiting for the divine to happen, for us to go up to heaven? This is a very fascinating cantata that we performed a few weeks ago in our factory year in St. Gallen 2021. And I am here today with Maestro Rudolf Lutz in order to give you a little bit more of information about this cantata, which is actually, Rudy, written as a choral cantata. What is actually a choral cantata? Well, Schwann, that's quite a difficult question to get that clear in a few moments, but I'll do my best, like I always do. A chorale is, I would say, the mother milk for the community. They, if you take the Nun danket alle Gott mit Herzen, Mund und Händen. Perhaps you even also know that one. People sung it when uh, uh, they were baptized. No, they didn't sing it, but they heard it as a baby. When they were 10, they heard it in, in school. When they were 12, they heard it in school and in church. And when they were 14, they heard it. Every year they heard it, they knew it. And when they soon were to die, they also knew it. It, it belonged to them, their treasure, actually. And um, you, Bach knows the energy of the chorale, and I'm sure that that was the reason that he said, new music, every Sunday a new cantata, uh, modern music, like you also hear it in the opera, with recitatives, with arias, with arioso, with choirs, but always again the melody you recognize. And in the choral cantata it's not only the melody which is used, but also the text for the first stanza, the first stanza, and for the Schlusschorale, the last stanza, and in the middle, the, the, the songwriter takes all those um, verses and brings them together for a beautiful composition. So it's very much concentrated on the text and the melody of the chorale. So do you think that people at that time would recognize that chorale the way we recognize today something like Let It Be, for instance? That's an excellent, that's an excellent uh, idea of yours, and I'll just try to do it. I'll improvise a bit of music. How should this music be in the effect? It should be hopeful, okay. like this cantata is. And then I'll bring in the let it be. You remember, let it be, let it be. People can indulge in the ra da 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 da. They say, "Oh, it's a lovely aria," and then suddenly they hear their famous and beloved piece. And normally, people are quite touched when they recognize a music. And I'm quite convinced, Schwann, that's what you said about it. That's the great effect of a chorale in a cantata. Hmm. So, what's the let it be of this cantata? What is it? Is it um, Ach Gott? Manches Herz light, how does it sound and where does it sound? There is something particular about it in this piece. The chorale people knew was normally in the upper voice. I will now just play it for you, that you can recognize it. It's got three same notes and then it goes down, a third, and then it comes back 
makes a little slur and ends here. Actually, quite difficult to remember. But if you listen to this, in Beethoven's style, it would be tum 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 tum. But here it's. And in this special cantata, the cantus firmus, or the chorale, is not in the soprano, where everybody has the, a better chance to recognize it, but in the bass. And that one really hears it. Um, Bach sets a trombone to it, and the bass is sing. <laughs> and that gives an incredible effect. So when you listen to the cantata, when it comes up in Bachipedia, or even if you listen to this uh, edition of our Bach factory once again, listen, you will really hear it. It sounds uh, incredibly strong. How would you think what Bach was his de decision that he took the cantus firmus in the bass? In the bass? Well, well, it could be interpreted as a way to the picked God support of, of, of this persona, of this character, of human being on its way to heaven, which is a very difficult way, as we said in the beginning. So Bach is always with us. Uh, God is always with us, supporting us. Bach is also Bach with is us. Also I like with that, us. what you <laughs> said. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, Bach in his work with the uh, organ, of course, also uses the cantus firmus, the chorale in the bass. You've got R noisy, rousy uh, um, stops on the organ called posaune bombarde or trombone or bombard, and then you've got the chorale in long notes. <laughs> so I'm sure people knew that idea if they went a lot to church, they heard that played on the organ. There is another aspect that strikes me about the beginning of this cantata, and it is. I don't really know whether we are in a major tonality or in a minor tonality. It's a kind of mixed situation, as the message of the music, of the text also is. What is happening there? What is going on? That's a very interesting uh, uh, observation, Schwann. And ladies and gentlemen, if you listen to the beginning, you really think it must be major. And here, a little tinge of minor. And then in another part of the piece, you have got this. Diminished in minor. Here got the feeling we are in um, in minor, and then a complete ending in major. One calls that moldur, minor major. It's actually a piece in ma in major, but has a lot of elements of. Uh, minor in it. Now a question to you, Schwann. How would you interpret that concerning the text? Mm. Again, I think it goes back to the same uh, meaning of trying to go up to heaven, to falling down and going up again and finding difficulties and finding a comfort. And this is the uh, human pathway to heaven, I think, in a way. It's a hard way, like also in terms of in musical terms, duriusculus. Ah, oh, yeah. The duriusculus. The duriusculus. We already use that. How would you de define it? Well, I think it's best if you kind of show us musically what, what, uh, what it is. The duriusculus means the hard pathway. And actually, it's a chromatical pathway going normally down in half notes in semitones. And if you listen to the melody, you've got the feeling how bright and beautiful this 
But if you listen to the main notes, da, 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 na, na. the Duriusculus, a very well known uh, idea of the Baroque part of the music, is here sort of disguised. Might it be interesting for you, ladies and gentlemen, to listen to the the, the high mass, mass in, in B minor, in the Crucifixus. There he also uses this Duriusculus. Listen to the beginning. And this piece is in minor. So you see, you can use the Duriusculus in minor and in major, and like uh, Schwann told us in a very beautiful way, you can actually really work with this. You can meld in minor, meld in major. And I think if you listen in, with these ears to other Bach pieces, you will very much and very much have big pleasure and recognize this fact. So Rudy, since you are talking about other pieces, I would like to go into a piece that carries actually the same name at this cantata, Ach Gott, wie manches Herzleid, but it carries the BWB number 58. So it must be that this piece uses the same chorale. Is that true? Exactly. That's the, that's the fact. I'll just fetch my score. I brought it along with me. You see, that looks like this. I always put on marks, I make lutzograms for myself that I understand how is the in interplay between choral and singing voices and this is quite an interesting piece. Uh, I can perhaps, do you think I'll, I'll explain it a bit? We'd be delighted if you would. It's, it's this music. I would say very majestic in the way he comes along. And you also hear a little bit of Duriusculus, listen. A little part. And then the soprano sings. And you heard the three notes and then the Beethoven and the squirrel, squirrel goes up and down but not in the one, two, one, two but three parts and then the bass comes in and says and did you hear the Duriusculus? Have patience, have patience, life is hard. Actually, in some way, the same idea as we showed in BWV3, but here in a complete other surrounding. How does this uh, give an effect for you, your ears and your heart and your soul? Well, it is certainly totally different, although he's using the same music and the same text. But I almost have the feeling that the uh, title of the cantata should be another one, because it's a lot more about being patient, isn't it? Geduld, geduld. I would have given the text for, from the bass as an idea for the title. No geduld, geduld, mein Herze. But We've got a rule that it's always the first words which, which appear in the cantata which give the title for the cantata. So in a way Bach was copying himself a little bit uh, when he wrote both pieces, wasn't he? I'm not even sure. I could imagine that he thought this chorale would now also be useful for this sort of cantata because uh, this is a cantata for the Sunday after New Year and the, the text in the Bible, in the Gospel, was the flight from Joseph and Maria with a baby to Egypt and terrible Herodes wanting to kill the baby. But you see, it's always the, bit, but the same human crisis and somebody who tries to help us. 
Eine böse Zeit is a kind of evil time. I think that sounds familiar to us now. But I would like now to talk a little bit about the human being, the persona, the character who is behind the piece that we're talking about today. So not BWB 58, but BWB 3. Who is the persona behind the music? How does he relate to himself? Though I feel fear of hell and pain, I must steadfast within my bosom a truly joyful heaven be. So I have to stick to it. I am very scared and it's a bitter way. What's going on musically with this human being? What's Bach depicting in this aria, which is number three of cantata BWB3, Rudy? starts with a cello and of course the continuo, the harpsichord or the organ or both together. You can also double the bass with a second cello or you could also take uh, a, bus, uh, a bass with it. Listen to the melody. <laughs> bass singer coming in. This is this person which Schwann is talking about sings Music of two low voices. What do you think about this music, Schwann? Well, I think it's horrible. It's very ugly. It's it's actually very ugly kind of music. But you're talking about Bach. Is Bach ever ugly? Well, you know, there is, could be some kind of beauty in, within the ugliness, which is the, the art the aspect of it. But empfindlich Hölling Angst und Pein, it makes it gives me the creeps. Well, I think the text is beautifully suitable for this music, or this music really is born out of the text, Höllen, Angst und Pein. And this fear, I think, that you, you told us at the beginning of uh, this introduction, it might be the anxiety of the Christ, of the Christian person who says, if I'm not really fine, if I'm not really believing, I'll come down to, into uh, uh, hell and will not rise up. And I think this, um, this economizing, how do you say, bewirtschaftung of, in English? Yes, well, that's very hard to say. What, uh, what is eine bewirtschaftung der Angst? Well, the economizing of fear. Yeah. Economizing. In, in that wow. time, they did that a lot. And I think it's, it's something people still love to do. And I think that's the reason, perhaps, that this music really has to sound ugly. Mm. Capitalizing on fear. 
maybe could be a better That's term a for that. That's a great word, yeah. Mm. Shall we hear what the performance yes. is actually? Yeah. <laughs> Did, did you hear that uh, when it said Ein Recht of Freudenschein, it has to be uh, a great joy in my heart how the music changes from this ugly mine with all those chromatical things, really damn difficult to play just to say for cello and also for the organ player and the harpsichord player. And then Bach just changes the situation. Yeah. Ein Recht auf Freude. Ah. So we hear in this cantata all the time this contrast between major and minor, between pain and fear and hope. And suddenly in number four, in the tenor recitative, Jesus comes to the fore. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the aspects of Jesus that come out in this recitative. Perhaps a little bit about Jesus' mysticism too, really. I'll be happy to do that. Schwann, I'll just change to, to Roland, my old companion here. Number four. It says, es mag mir Leib und Geist verschmachten. Bist du, o oh Jesu, mein, und ich bin dein, will ich's nicht achten. A little challenge to Mr. Castinera. I will play it and sing it, and you will afterwards translate it in English. Oh. <laughs> Fortunately, I have the German text here, so ah, I can you cheat. Ah, sh you shouldn't have said that. You should have just, everybody would have said, oh, Schwann and his uh, uh, German translation, his English translation. Listen to the chords, the quality of the chords. Es mag mir Leib und Geist verschmachten, bist du O Jesu mein, und ich bin dein, will ich's nicht achten. Now first the English translation, ladies and gentlemen. Well, what he's basically saying is, Jesus, I am yours and you are mine. This is the, uh, the Kernbotschaft, right, of the whole uh, paragraph. And the Verschmachten. Yeah, that's a very hard one. <laughs> Suffering, dying, collapsing. I saw it, it says actually, when I'm feeling really down the dumps and it's very terrible, I feel it's my great security knowing that I am yours and you are mine. And I would say that's this mysticism which we find in the great book of songs, in the great book of love, which say, I'm sort of the bride, and Jesus is the bridegroom. And at the end, we've got the the the, um, the sentence. Mein Jesus wird mein Schatz und reich um sein. Mein Jesus wird mein Schatz und Reichtum sein. I think that's a little easier to translate to English. Well, Jesus is depicted as a treasure and as true wealth. And this reminds me actually very much of um, the first performance we did this year in January with BWB 65, Sie werden aus aber alle kommen, where Jesus is depicted too as true wealth. You remember, gold aus Ophia is too schlecht. So any kind of gold is too slight, is too bad, true wealth is actually Jesus. Yeah. 
And if you really want to give Jesus something, then give him your heart. So it's a love story between Jesus and, and the soul. So now that you mentioned and you talked about this mystical relationship in the eternal recitative, it's perhaps no coincidence that Bach writes a duet, an aria, in the next uh, movement, Rudy. So what's going on musically there? Can you give us an example? We've got a unison, oboe one, oboe two, with the violins of the first group, and we've got a basso continuo. The basso continuo plays It's going back and forward, and in the moment where the basses are on the long note, the upper voice does and then the, the alto sings Soprano uh, imitated. It's always the same melody. It goes a long time. Sometimes you've got the feeling it's like a berceuse, a cradle song, but it's talking from sorrows, but I think feeling at home, feeling fine in Jesus' uh, uh, hand, like we heard the Cantus Firmus in the first choir in the bass. Here I am, I'll carry you when you've got problems. I don't know. Schwann, what's your, uh, what's your opinion on this? Well, I mean, if we consider the text, we have this uh, dialogue between these two voices, which could also be a mystical thing. And uh, what the text is actually saying is that when these human beings are worried, then they sing out loud. So music itself is depicted as a kind of silver bullet, a Königsweg, yeah? the, the best way to reach out to this divinity that we are hoping for, isn't it? Yeah. That's a nice way of explaining that. Um, but what's the meaning of this unison? You mentioned the unison in the beginning of your... Yeah. Well, unison is in music that a few people on different or same instruments do the same at the same time. And Schwann, what would you think if we would try to sing a unison? We could try, perhaps oh. in this. Let's try together. It's very high. Ladies and gentlemen, you exactly see the problem you've got. Oboe 1, Oboe 2 have to play the same. Normally they're not exactly on time and the pitch is also not quite perfect. So it's a hard work. And then the violins come with that. So you've got three violins singing and playing the same and, and two oboes playing the same. It gives another sort of sound. It's like for me a community saying something. It's not a single person. So you see, that might be some of importance that Bach says, this is a very important voice, so I want to put it unison. It's not really louder, but it's fuller and it's got more energy in it. Wow. So why don't we listen to the music itself? And before doing that, we want to remind our audiences that the real recording of this concert will be coming up on Bachipedia in a few weeks. So now let's listen to this duet and to this aria. <laughs>